Awesome. Hello. My name is Kat Abenstein and I'm the program coordinator for the Saskatchewan Writers Guild. And I'm excited to welcome you to the launch of Windscript Volume 36, an event that's part of the Cathedral Village Arts Festival 2020 Kaleidoscope. I'll lead us through some housekeeping items first and introduce our feature poet. And after our poet Trinity Squirrel performs, I'll introduce uh, everyone to Tara Giroux, who is the Windscript editor, editor and our host for the contributor readings. We are all coming together from different places across Saskatchewan and maybe the country and maybe the world today. But I wanted to acknowledge that myself, the Saskatchewan Writers Guild, and the Cathedral Village Arts Festival are located in Treaty 4, the original territory of the Nihiawak, Anishinaabeg, Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota people, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. This land and the relationships within them are important to our work and to our writing, and I want to acknowledge that we are all treaty people. We'd also like to thank our funders and partners, without whom this publication would not be possible. For the Saskatchewan Writers Guild, we'd like to thank the City of Regina, Bass Culture, and Saskatchewan Lotteries, and Print West for donating to the printing of Windscript. We'd like to extend a special thank you to the Cathedral Village Arts Festival for creating space where arts of all kinds and people of all ages can flourish. The CVAF major sponsors and funders who help make the festival possible, the City of Regina, Saskatchewan Arts Board, Sask Culture, Sask Lotteries, Rolco Radio, and Canadian Heritage. There are more, and you can see the complete list of all these sponsors and more online events at cvaf.ca. We also have the option of supporting the festival through an online 50-50 draw located at www.arts5050.ca, 18 plus. Finally, thank yous to my fellow CVAF Literary Committee folks and sponsors who make the literary events like this one possible. Saskatchewan Writers Guild, Sask Book Awards, Radiant Press, Vertigo Series, and League of Canadian Poets. So why don't we just get right into it? On your screen, you'll see a bio for Trinity Squirrel, our feature poet for today. Trinity has been writing and, and creating work for years, and I've had the pleasure of seeing his work grow over um, the last few years. And I'm so excited for you all to hear Trinity's work today. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Trinity Squirrel. Well, uh, these first two poems I'm about to present are from uh, my first collection called Manuscript. It's not a very creative original title, but it represents a point in my life where uh, I was beginning to understand the power and importance of sharing, connecting, and harmony. All right, live for. I live for this feeling. But a piece of me dies each time I see that look, that look of pitiful love as I stumble into the room. Pity for the excuse of a distant memory that I know you pegged me as. Love that you can only hope I will try to grasp since our past diverged long ago. I live for this feeling. Locking lips with the rim of my cup as if it was a long lost lover. Sharing in the spirits of pain souls as if we were brothers, but they're only strangers that I see when we're all short on funding. Drowned out melodies conceal our internal cries throughout the night. I live for this feeling. This position I'm in is genetic and the only birthright I have. My vice and my blood being the only connection I have to my dad. Father and son, two wastes of potential, folded under pressure and hung up on skin. The weightlessness of giving in and the embracing of heavy gin. I live for this feeling. The lessons I seem to forget after I spilled my soul into the floor. They give me reasons to quit, but my weakness always wants more. More distance between me and this existence, more pace, the pacing and exhilaration of this inhibition. I live for this feeling. Blood. 
Anger feels my passion, but my passion is drowned in vices. I sedate till I'm passive, my heart's as dark as night is. Whether on the reserve or in a city, I stay where it's lightless. That doesn't mean I need your pity. I don't seek your kindness. You just have to hear me out and take a look from where my mind is. Imagine a man who causes a joke, provides for you through the dryness. Then he comes and takes your while and spouts that his actions righteous, taking advantage of a crisis and all the people blinded to the slyness of the ways in which you promise guidance. You will always be provided for and this agreement will be timeless, but not even touch your water, you need to buy a license. The devil bought our land, but peace of mind is priceless. So we just give our thanks and suffer in our silence, taking drugs to numb this pain because we'd rather be mindless or else the doctor prescribed it. They label us a savage because of our likeness. So why should we fight it when we're surrounded by violence? Rural road borders keep the natives in the country. Angry old farmers shoot before they see us running. Liberals try to solve all our problems with their money. Conservatives claim that we got what was coming. Neither plastic nor words can heal the generations of stars. It takes action, not swords, but the kind men pull from their hearts. We shoot for the stars because we live beyond our means. Doomed from the start, but that won't take the smile from our cheeks. I cannot stand idly by when my people are killed. With healing comes time to cry, but these feelings remain here. All of these deaths being justified because peace is not real. Stuck with these cards in life that evil powers deal. We're all siblings with them. It's so much deeper than races. But unfortunately, our forefathers can't look in each other's faces without exchanging seething hate or seeking out cases. These bullheaded old men destroying us within like we're vases. Court-ordered appearances with lawyers in court wear laces. I've lost more friends at Dojak than Shakespeare's point phrases. Face is stoic, breaking inside, on the surface we're fearless. Ego is much stronger than the fragility of our spirits. There's jib in the streets and you can sleep in without sheets. Your ignorance will have people believe that there's peace. Crack country streets, keep the thugs in the ghetto. As long as we're out of sight, the hood is on memento. Oh Canada, the land of the free. Where colored men don't have character, the cops in the street. Your name at the top is exactly what they don't want. Your profile before you even get one chance to talk. My stomach hungers for justice as this government fumbles the public. We run from this numbness. We protest, but nothing is published. Iniquity is permitted, so nothing is trusted. Victims to the system, your honor, busted. These are from my first two collection. Um, these, next, these next ones are from my newest collection called Observations from the Bottom. Uh, it represents a period of my adolescence where I felt alone, a dark point in my life. And I just felt share, like sharing it because I wanted to give others the words I never had. I, wanted, I want everyone to feel like they're not alone because I was that way too. One, I come from dead lights or voodoo bills and cold frosts. No contact with my father, mom had no job. CCB and GST gave me everything you see. Since elementary, I've never been a part of a community. All the drive that I have comes from all that I lack. When I needed help, no one was there but I knack. How can I strive for independence when I'm dependent on being a statistic? Two. I'm a haphazard bastard that doesn't know how to talk. Constantly searching for answers like a sheep lost from its flock. My fears like a prowling panther creeping in the shadows, ready to pounce at any point and turn my hide into a flannel. Never managed to keep a shepherd. My mind is all that I've got. My days can be battles. I'm growing faster than I thought. I love gray weather because it's as dreary as me. I say what I mean. I never keep my tongue in my cheek. I'm always acting passive. Fighting time like a clock. I get lost in distraction. That's one of my many flaws. Trying to chase my passions, I'm quickly losing the will. I've got to persist, but the truth is, the struggle is real. Three, I'm too kind to myself. I find ways to enjoy being a waste of potential. I always somehow find a way to look at my life in a negative light. My psyche falls apart like a house of cards. My dreams are like awkward sandcastles on a beach small and fragile, and I'm not one for going outside. So I'm wont to watch through my window as they crumble. Some persist, the sand is flimsy, and any pressure on the wind creates a mess. A tidal wave of emotions could at any moment instantly erode my sandcastles, 
scattering sediment and serotonin for the world plots against me. The places my enemies or my friends would be. Hate where I once found love. A damaged soul. My existence is worth less than my shoes. The point of pride I poured my pockets for, which became only a reminder of regret and retrospect. It is as if my flowering hopes and yearnings have cocooned themselves away, evolving me to fragments of my devotion. Five, if I could somehow leave without leaving a mark, fade away into the void, the shadows, the dark, I'd be satisfied momentarily, then I'd be gone. Early morning fog swept away by the wind, consumed by the earth, swallowed. Six, I spend most of my days thinking about you, but when I put my pen to the paper, I can't seem to find the words. I give the world to you, but I know you don't want it. Seven, we're told to be mindful, but to also mind our own. Be welcoming, but don't talk to a man you don't know. The second you step out of line, your time is up. Your clock gets corrected no matter the fun. We're told to practice mindfulness and to always be real. But the moment you open up, no one cares how you feel. Now that little teen's grown into a man full of shame, a belly full of pills and a mind full of hate, an entire generation raised on pills and prescriptions. Hey. Mouth shut, I keep my thoughts locked away, pen behind a gate. I love her, but the hardest thing is looking my mother in the face and telling her that her son's down in the dumps, feeling like waste. No, instead I tell her that I love her and hope for better days. Nine, rock bottom is waking up at 8 p.m. on a weekday and going back to bed. Rock bottom is waking up at 12.30 p.m. and then going back to bed. Rock bottom is waking up at 4 p.m. and finally deciding to stay awake. Rock bottom is thinking about the hole you dug yourself into, continuing to dig deeper. Rock bottom is ceasing to care for yourself, but continuing to love those around you. Rock bottom is feeling grateful for people even talking to you. Rock bottom is failing to care for the reasons you do what you do. Rock bottom is letting yourself get pushed into a pool of stress and continuing to swim. Rock bottom is letting go. Letting go of yourself. Letting go of the world. Letting go of the moment. 10. Are you happy? The answer to this question doesn't matter. The true answer lies in how you react. You could see it as a reality check, a slap in the face of realization, a kick in the ass of admittance. Maybe for this fortunate, it's a sigh of relief, a moment of clarity. You realize where you are. Maybe you don't know what's wrong. Maybe you don't know what's good. Either way, the truth is that happiness is unattainable. Life is the perpetual pursuit of happiness. You're not meant to have it. You can only reach out and try to grasp it. But that's it. There's a setback in life around every corner. But you can't let that fact hold you back. Or else you're already gone. You just got to keep on trucking and hope for the best. Know that you'll get yours, even though life continues to seem like a test. Happiness is just the label slapped on a combination of chemicals. Don't let words get in your way or hold you down and keep you miserable. The answer doesn't matter, and the question doesn't either. You're going down your own path, and you're your own leader. Right, and this last one, um, this last one represents a, a new period of my writing where it's a different kind of introspection. I'm on the inside looking out because I can never keep my mind in the clouds. Day by day, my time is running out. The seconds turn to hours when you're not around. If I could just get my feet back on the ground, or I could throw my heart into the lost and found. Please just find me. Put it all behind me. She thinks I'm lively, but lovely isn't like me. When the good damage is the bad damage, and the bad damage is the good damage, either or, you can all have it. I am not from this planet, where the good boys are the bad boys, and the bad boys are the good boys. It all just sounds like white noise. Living like this wasn't my choice. Uh, that's set. Thank you for listening. I appreciate it. Wow. Thank you so much, Trinity, for all of your work, for sharing with us your evolution as an artist. Uh, and I'm so excited to see where you go with your writing. Windscript has been around for several decades now. 
It has been publishing the best of Saskatchewan high school students' literature since 1983. It was created by Victor Jarrett Enns, the executive director of the Saskatchewan Writers Guild from 1982 to 88. His enthusiasm and determination kept the magazine alive in its first two years until permanent funding could be found. For 21 years, the magazine was distributed free to all high schools and libraries in the province. By 2004, funding sources were no longer available and the print publishing of the magazine was replaced by electronic versions through the SWG website. In 2011, due to popular demand from students and teachers and community, as well as offering it online, the SWG was once again able to publish this magazine for promising young writers in print form with the generous support of Houghton Boston. From 2018 to 2020, Print West donated to the cost of printing. And for the first year ever, we are hosting a digital launch this year. While we miss seeing everybody in person, we're delighted to see how we can reach more people with our digital offerings. Shirley Fair, the SWG Publications Coordinator, is behind the thoughtful and beautiful design of Winscript. She has truly embodied the spirit of the magazine and brought even more magic to the publication because of her tireless efforts. So thank you, Shirley. And I'll show you on my screen this year's magazine. It'll look backwards to you, or maybe it won't, or maybe it will. So this is what it looks like for this year and it's packed full of beautiful writing, images, and more. Next, I'd love to introduce you to Tara Juro. Winscript has had the pleasure of working with phenomenal editors in its history, and this year is no different. Tara has been an incredible help, very thorough, kind, compassionate, and talented, and is really, uh, has put a lot of work into helping our uh, high school writers develop their, or expose rather, their best possible pieces to be published in this magazine. So I'm pleased to introduce you to Tara Jiro. Hi everyone. Thanks for tuning in. And first of all, I want to thank Trinity. That was incredible. Um, your poems, what a treat. Um, just thank you for reading. It was wonderful. Um, I, um, it was really an honor to be an editor uh, for this year's um, issue. It was also really, really tough. There were so many amazing pieces submitted and uh, so many amazing pieces included. It's, I'm excited. Um, I think what I'm gonna do is read um, the uh, introduction that I wrote for the, um, the magazine. The Invincible Feeling of Youth and the Tragedy of Losing Someone, Falling in Love for the First Time and the Peril of Loneliness, Parents Who Betray You, and the healing power of art, discovering new lands, new people, and missing old ones, navigating relationships with friends, family, society, ourselves. This is life, this is writing, this is Winscript, volume 36. I had read previous issues of Winscript, so I knew the quality of writing that I would be reading and working with. Uh, this time around was different. Um, as an editor, I reread and reread all of the pieces included here, and each reading brought a new layer of meaning, a new layer of appreciation. Uh, the writing inside the covers astounded me. The themes, the themes explored are vast and complicated and deep. I was floored by how these themes are explored. The writers used diverse and unique styles and techniques. They took risks. Some pieces challenge the reader, some nail the genre they're working within, and some are deceptively simple. Editing the issue was not an easy task to complete. There were over 100 submissions, but it was one that was exciting and personally enriching. The intensity with which these writers write is impressive. Their voices are loud, raw, and true. It's writing that's full of life, even when dealing with the death, regret, loss, 
and perhaps even especially, especially so then. I'm really happy I was a part of this year's edition. Um, I want to say a big thanks to the Saskatchewan Writers Guild for the opportunity, uh, to Kat for her guidance and support, um, to Shirley for designing the magazine and capturing its essence so perfectly, um, to the previous editors for laying the path, and lastly, but most especially, I want to thank the writers. It was an incredible experience for me to read their stories and poems and work with each one of them individually to exchange thoughts on their writing and on writing in general. Uh, their dedication and passion are inspiring and infectious. Um, so yes, it was a real joy uh, to edit this year. And uh, to those who are about to read the following pages and hear some of the readings, I hope you experience the same journey. Uh, the writing here will make you hold your breath, clench your fists, break wide open, and soar. Um, so, um, yeah, thanks to everyone who submitted this year. Um, it's hard to select only a sliver of submissions. So don't be discouraged if your work wasn't selected. Uh, keep writing, keep submitting. Um, I want to send a special thanks out to the teachers, the parents, the guardians, and everyone else who encouraged youth to submit to the magazine. Um, it takes uh, an entire community to create Winscript. Um, thanks to all of our contributors. Every single one had an incredible impact on the overall magazine, and we're going to hear from some of them today. I'm going to read out a list of all the contributors. Um, Andrea Caswell. Ann Stoppler, Cassie Meyer, Charity Klassen, Claire Nagel, Emily Zbereszczak, Gabrielle Berg, Heidi Turfla, Cameron Haven, Madeline Caban, Michaela Millen, Myra Butter, Olivia Johnston, Sarah Robert, Sarah Marie Nadeau, Saija Lamatanen, Suhila Al-Jadawi, Taylor McKenzie, Theron Lucas Michael, Trina Friesen, Tristan Dupre, Warsha Mushtag, and Zareen Grindle. So now we're gonna go uh, talk a little bit about the awards and the um, honorable mentions. Um, it was uh, not only really tough selecting submissions uh, to be included, but it was really hard to select um, the award winners and honorable mentions. Um, but the six um, that did receive an award or an honorable mention were uh, pieces that I just could not stop thinking about. Um, they were just constantly running through my head and every time I would reread them, a new um, understanding, uh, something new would I would discover. Um, so they just, yeah, really impressive. And I'm excited that you're going to hear from uh, the writers today. Um, so there are uh, three different categories. There's the Jarrett Ends Award. Um, the Jarrett Ends Awards recognize ex excellence for high school write student writing in poetry and prose. So there's one for poetry and one for prose. Um, named in honor of Victor Jarrett Enns, who was the executive director of the Saskatchewan Writers Guild from 1982 to 1988. Uh, a third award for art was discontinued in 1996. Today, the Poetry and Prose Awards continue to be presented, as well as an honorable mention in each category. So this year, the Jarrett Enns Award for Poetry is Sohila El Jadawi with Adolescence. Honorable mention goes to Warsha Mushtag for Karachi Bazaar. And this year, the Jarrett Ends Award for Prose is Sarah Marie Nadeau with a cup of black breakfast tea. And the honorable mention goes to Cameron Haven for Cutting Remorse. There is also the Curry Highland Prize, and it's awarded uh, for excellence in poetry to a high school writer living outside of Regina or Saskatoon. The award was established in 1992 by the Saskatchewan Writers Guild and the Literary Community of Moose Jaw as a tribute to Robert Curie 
and Gary Highland in recognition of the literary, literary excellence they achieved in their many published words and to acknowledge their commitment and generosity to their students and fellow writers. This year, the Curry Highland Prize for Poetry is Emily's Barris check with And Read All Over. An honorable mention goes to Bronte Sloat for You Are Ours. So each award winner and honorable mention will receive a certificate. So now it's the part that I'm really excited about. We're gonna hear from uh, the, uh, the winning work from our award winners and honorable mentions. And the first up is Sohila El Jadawi with Adolescence. Sohila is a grade 11 student at Bedford Road. She enjoys reading, writing poetry, reading and writing poetry in her free time. She also likes reading classic literature, music, and trying new things. And she hopes to attend university after high school. Hello everyone, thank you for coming today. Um, my piece, Adolescence, is about how the world sees my generation, the teenagers, the adolescents, and mainly about how I see us. There's something about being an adolescent, and it's not the drinking or the sex. It's testing that edge born from recklessness and looking death right in the eyes and saying, I'm invincible. It's walking the streets until 3 a.m., looking at the weeping sky and wondering. They say reckless, we say free. We aren't chained birds yet. Let us throw our bodies and hearts until we shatter. See, the secret is to break yourself so much you can't put yourself together again. Foolhardy, we spit on our faces, daring, we roll back. Our body is light with the desperation that our wings won't fly as far. There's something about lying in bed with the boy you love, his hands roaming down your body. He says he loves you, but you know it won't last, and yet you throw your heart into his, and he does the same. We're invincible, his fingers say. You know he isn't the one, but right now he is, and that's enough. Our teeth break against beer bottles, and the smeared lipstick looks like blood. We laugh still, our tear-stained face is invisible, even to us. Lying in the burning wreckage of our lives, the fire burns, and we're the ones who lit the match. Bring the ashes down, we say. We're untouchable. The day is a prayer, and not ours of salvation. Twelve a.m. is sacred, and so are the texts. The one we exchange when everything sleeps, and the only light from that tiny screen, and the racing heart beneath. Her eyes droop, but she needs me right now. I have to stay. There's something about being an adolescent, and it's not the adventures, but the way we're emotionless and to follow feelings at the same time. Our only goal is to feel again. Yay! Thanks, Sohila. That was incredible. Um, our next reader is uh, Warsha Mushtag with her piece, Karachi Bazaar. Uh, Warsha is an emerging writer who has a passion for social justice. Born into a life of privilege and comfort, she believes story can broaden our perspectives and spread messages of hope, resilience, and equity. Growing up on the prairies, she has always loved reading, writing, and learning more about the diverse world around her. Hi everyone, my poem is called Karachi Bazaar, and it's about a place that holds a really important place in my heart. These are the streets of the storytellers who carry twigs from the eric trees in between their teeth, walk with gold and silver threaded chapels stolen from the skins of creatures claimed by the Himalayas, branded by the forest and its monsoon rains. These are the streets of the merchants who are searching in quiet corners for warmth in a place bursting with clipped, luring voices Cotton, chiffon, and linen washed in a whirlwind of colors, little girls with bangles that topple from their wrists, and an ancient laughter that spans the seas, thick and smoky round the lips. These are the streets of the children who create memories in the trees and from the guawas smuggled in their mouths and the throats of their school bags, the soft palates of their flowy blue kurtas flooding stalls of golgapas, samosas, and naan, whose crunch carries their dajijan's voice and rests in their alleyway games, books, and dreams. These are the streets of the heroes who started just like you and me, 
girls and boys with hands painted in tamarind chutney and henna, swirling like the sunrise in the Arabian Sea. Thank you, Warsha. That was beautiful. Our next reader is Cameron Haven with Cutting Remorse. Uh, Cameron is a grade 10 student from Milford. She loves a good pun and a sarcastic comment, as well as poutine and cherry Pepsi. She also loves writing stories. My story is called Cutting Remorse. We barely knew one another. You didn't grow up together or go to the same elementary school. She had her friends and you had yours. There was no reason for your paths to cross. If you saw her in the cafeteria, you wouldn't have blinked twice. That is, until this year. This year, you were in the same class. You sat next to each other every day. One of those days, you leaned across the aisle and the two of you started talking. The conversations were innocent. There was nothing special about them. When you talked, you talked about simple things, your likes, your dislikes, your hobbies. You didn't mention her at home and you didn't mention her to your other friends. To be honest, you never really thought of her outside of class. Then, halfway through the year, you were partnered together for a project. That's why you exchanged phone numbers. That's why you didn't think anything of it when she texted you that night. You expected the text to be something about the project. You never expected the picture and those six words. You'll never forget the way the picture hit you. It was a punch in the stomach. You'll never recover from seeing those eight cuts she had slashed into her arm. The words she scrawled across the picture, they'll haunt you forever. I don't know what to do. Those six words, those 17 letters, that one text, your life changed forever. When she asked you not to tell, you promised you wouldn't. But deep down, a part of you knew, knew you needed to. You had learned about this in school for years, the results of self-harm. In the back of your mind, you knew it was going to end badly. But you had already promised. So for days on end, you didn't speak. Not to your friends, not to your family. You kept your head down at school and your bedroom door closed at home. You didn't eat or sleep. You could barely breathe. You're so damn worried about what other people would think. This girl had chosen you to tell and no one else. What right did you have to tell anyone her business? You were half convinced that people wouldn't believe you anyway. What would they think of you then? Most of all, you were sure that if you had told anyone, the girl would panic and do something even worse. But God, you were only 14 years old. You never dealt with any life and death situations. You had no idea how to handle it. The girl needed help, but so did you. You should have told someone. You should have told your mom as she walked past your room that night. You should have told her about the picture or the message or your promise. You should have cried, fallen apart. Your mom would have held you as you sobbed into her shoulder. You know she would have. Then she would have put you back together and you both could have helped the girl. You were scared. Anyone would have been. But if you had told, that fear would have subsided. Your mom could have called her mom. Even though there were perfect strangers, your mom could have simply told her to check on her daughter. It would have been the hardest thing you've ever done. You would have had another sleepless night staring up at your ceiling for hours. Your phone, silent beside you, would have tormented you, because if your phone was silent, it meant her house was anything but. And things wouldn't have fixed themselves overnight. For weeks, even months, you would have watched this girl. It would have been impossible not to look over her during class to stare at her long sleeves, wondering if she was covering old scars or hiding new ones, wondering if she was still hurting or if she was healing, wondering if she was still lost or if she had finally figured out the right thing to do. Wondering would have been a hell of a lot better than never telling. Because today, instead of walking to a church, you could have walked into class. Instead of seeing her face in the frame, you could have glanced over and seen her next to you. And instead of one final goodbye, you could have had a million more hellos. If you would have told, things would have been so different. Because you would have given the girl you barely knew the chance to wear a t-shirt. Thank you, Cameron. That was amazing. Our next reader. Excuse me. <clears throat> Our next reader is Emily Zbereschek with her poem and read all over. Emily is a grade 11 student who is passionate about the arts and mildly obsessed with Broadway mu musicals. When she isn't writing day and night, she like, like she needs it to survive. She enjoys playing piano, drawing, and spending time with her family and cats. Hi, everyone. So, Welcome, and it's nice to see that some people are here and watching. Um, so um, this past last semester, I took a creative writing class, and I was introduced to a poetry format called a reverse poem. And the idea behind a reverse poem is that you write a poem that can be read line by line from top to bottom, and then again, line by line from bottom to top. 
And the second reading from bottom to top usually reverses the meaning of the first reading. And so it's a really great format for exploring different perspectives or the flip sides of issues. And so when I chose to write a poem using this format, I wanted to write about a subject where the opinions about it are really divided into two sides. So I ended up choosing gun violence. And it seems like in the news recently, it's um, come up a lot. And by it coming up a lot, there's been a lot of debate about it. And both sides are very divided in their opinions. So in this poem, the first reading will be from the shooter's perspective and the from top to bottom. And then the second reading is from the victim's perspective from bottom to top. And read all over. Everything is black and white, still. Still streets, dark sky, blinding lights. The heart of the city throbbing, this pulsing sound like percussion in a symphony. Listen, a gunshot. Try telling the world it was just an accident. How will they react? Will they be told I have a family? Listen, he had a gun. I had a family. Fight or flight, I thought. I thought he had a gun. He seemed suspicious. I didn't think. What went wrong? Fear overtaking me, all I thought of was my safety. Along with life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, don't I have the right to bear arms? Why must others judge, assign blame, guilt, fault? His dying breaths are shallow, draining. I'm like a bird in a cage. My heart beats frantically. Everything is red all over. Blood. Another mark on this world. I have no chance to make a second amendment. It comes down to this. My story against his story. I hope the world doubts what happened was clear. What happened was clear. I hope the world doubts his story. It comes down to this. My story against the second amendment. I have no chance to make another mark on this world. Blood. Everything is red. All over. Heart beats frantically like a bird in a cage. My breaths are shallow. Training. I'm dying. His fault. Judge. Assign blame. Guilt. Why must others bear arms? Don't I have the right to the pursuit of happiness, liberty, and life along with my safety? All I thought of was fear overtaking me. What went wrong? I didn't think. I didn't think he seemed suspicious. He had a gun. I thought, fight or flight. I had a family. He had a gun. Listen, I have a family. How will they react? Will they be told it was just an accident? Try telling the world, listen, a gunshot. Like percussion in a symphony, throbbing. This pulsing sound of the city, streets, dark sky, blinding lights, the heart still. Still, everything is black and white. Thank you. Wow, Emily, thank you very much for that reading. That was very powerful. Um, our uh, sixth and looks like our final, that went really fast, our final reader um, is uh, Bronte Sloat with You Are Ours. However, Bronte is actually writing an AP exam today. So um, she was uh, recorded a video and sent it in and we will play her video for you now. My name is Bronte Sloat and this is my poem, You Are Ours. He was young, says the light in his eyes, dulled by enlarged, incoherent pupils, and broken too, says the missing corner of his health card. He's been here before, says the man, restraining his own little brother, exhaustion in his tone. They used to play wrestle, says his skilled grasp, but now it holds tight out of necessity. If he lets go, say the ready legs, we will run and run until we cannot be found. He was familiar, say the nurses in his ward. His kindness and manners masked his wounds. 
People loved him, says the steady stream of visitors coming and going from his barren room. They're scared, say the panicked glances and demands to the doctors. He was fun, say the children, remembering. Stories read and games played. They don't understand, say the things. He will never be able to do again. You need us, say the dark streets. He isn't here, says his indecipherable speech. Paranoid, says his fleeting gaze. Don't listen to them, say the voices in his breath, lingering on every single whispering sound. You are ours, say the people in the shadows. You are ours. Thank you. Wow, so um, that was amazing. Uh, thank you all for reading your pieces. It was a real treat to hear um, the words aloud in your own voices. Um, thank you. Um, so I think it's time to hand the mic off back to Kat. Hi, thanks Tara. Actually, I think we have one more reader uh, who I'd like to invite to read their piece. Um, so I'm just going to put the slideshow a little back. Uh, Sarah Marie and uh, Tara, would you uh, um, introduce? Absolutely. My apologies, Sarah. I skipped right over that, um, messed up my papers. Um, so yes, Sarah Mar Marie Nadeau uh, with her um, story called A Cup of Black Bre Breakfast Tea. Um, Sarah Marie has always had a keen interest in expressing herself through uh, writing, visual art, and music. Having lived in Western and Eastern Canada, as well as the Arctic region, she has been exposed to many cultures and people who have greatly influenced her artistic style. She draws her inspiration from the many voices and stories that often go unheard. Sarah Marie. Thanks, Dara. Um... A cup of black breakfast tea. A tense moment went by before I let out a long, calming breath. My shoulders slumped. My heart slowed from a sprint to a trot. My eye, I closed my eyes and begged my hands to stop shaking. The shattered china was at my feet. I was so still as if it too had been anticipating the loathing words and the raging fists. Shards were, shattered, were scattered across the yellowing kitchen floors waiting to slice the silence open and watch it bleed onto the tiles. Several seconds slipped away and still no stir in the apartment, not even from the bedroom I knew she was sleeping in. Gingerly, I crouched down and began cleaning up the teacup I had dropped. My fingers evaded sharp edges while trying not to succumb to the fear, blind terror at the thought of the woman waking up when that cup hit the floor, at the thought of her exploding through the bedroom door and glaring the hate in her eyes as they connected with the crime scene. Me, among the precious China, committing a heinous act because everything I do is evil and despite her. That is what she would scream with an alcohol-laced breath as her palm connects with my already bruised cheek, as my own words die at my lips. Corpses of broken pleas for a fair chance to explain would shatter on the ground as they plummet. I suppose they know, however, that their attempts were futile and their deaths were in vain. The meaning of accident doesn't exist within these walls. I know how she would delight in my knees bleeding as I fall to the ground, how she would kick me and order me to clean up my mess and my worthlessness while she settled back to, into bed, wearing the same black dress as the night before. She didn't wake up though. She didn't burst through the door. She's asleep. I quickly deposited the shards in the garbage and resumed boiling water for tea, breakfast tea. Black. It's what I've been drinking every morning for the past seven years. I used to wake up to pancakes and milk, but when my father left just after my fifth birthday, big breakfasts had trickled down to cereal or dry toast. Then when I was six and the drinking got out of hand, and the woman I had to live with simply forgot to buy cereal and milk and bread. I remember stealing money from her cheap purse and sneaking off to the gas station down the street. I could barely read, but I recognized the words on the small yellow box. Breakfast. I had bought it and scampered home. Since then, I've stuck with the tea. It's been easy to make and doesn't expire. A cup of black breakfast tea every morning had become the only reliable routine in my life. 
Even when the woman would bring home strange men at night and forget to give me supper, I could grab a chair and stand to stand on and reach the top shelf, grab my small yellow box and listen to the water boiling instead of what was happening in that bedroom. The yellow happy box would say good morning to me on the cloudiest days and I would look forward to every time I pulled out of the cabinets. I grabbed a new cup and poured the hot water. Two small sips later, I felt a stabbing pain in my foot. One blink later, I see the blood oozing out from a small piece of china lodged in my heel. I couldn't decide whether to swear because I'd missed a piece or because of the unexpected pain. In the end, I decided to swear because of the fact that our medical supplies are stashed under the bed along with a few bottles of illegal pills. I, sh I would either have to bleed out all over the floor or disturb the woman and possibly suffer a bloody nose. I decided to take the chance on less blood. A steady breath braced me as I slowly made my way over to the wooden bedroom door of the too small apartment. My hand held the wooden door knob firmly and I twisted it gently. I winced as the door creaked while I creaked, cracked it open. When I opened my eyes, my mouth fell into a silent gasp and I pushed the door wider. I didn't notice it as it slammed against the door dirty wall, nor did I notice the dull ache of my injured foot anymore. There she was, a needle still stuck in her bruised arm. The woman was jerking on the bed and foam overflowed from her gaping mouth. She was incomprehensible. Her grotesque yet soft choking noises were the only sounds as she convulsed and shook. My first instinct was to slowly close the door and wait for it all to be over. To go back to my tea and maybe reread the morning paper, to pretend like I was in complete ignorance, to burst into the bedroom maybe half an hour later, call the authorities, pretend that I was too late to save her. When I found her, she was already dead. Just like that, I would be free. The woman who forced so many tears from my eyes and inflicted so much pain in my short life would be gone. She would finally get a horrible ending to her even more horrible existence. I stared silently at the woman who gave birth to me, who had nursed me, played games with me before I could even talk, but I couldn't look away from that same woman who wounded me so deeply and starved me of more than just cereal and milk and bread. I ached for the sound of the door clicking shut and for my nightmare to end. I wanted her dead, and I have for years. I reached for the doorknob. Tears escaped my eyes one last time. I limped to the kitchen and reached for the old bright red rotary telephone. Three turns and, a phone was and the phone was waiting for someone far away to answer. Every move of my body and every second that ticked by felt mechanical. I hung up the phone after a strong and kind voice told me to hold on, they would be right there. I had lived with a mother who had let her daughter die every day, and it would be easy to become a daughter who let her mother die today. However, I also knew, while I felt nothing standing in that doorway watching her waste away from the luring contents of an unclean needle, I was not my mother's daughter. I was the one who held her hair back when she leaned over the toilet that didn't quite flush right. I was the one who took the punches and the pain over and over without throwing it all back. Until that moment, I never had the courage to think of my mother as small and broken, someone who could be killed with something as insignificant as a needle. I had never thought about her as a human who was flawed. Something in my chest, it changed the way I looked at the four walls around me. It changed the way I thought about her. It changed the way I saw myself. I knew that I would be the one to make my children pancakes every morning, to never let, leave them for a drink when they cry from a nightmare or wet their bed, never hurt someone that I meant to protect, never starve them of love. I knew the person I would become would always do the right thing, even though it hurts. I sat down at the kitchen table and took a few more sips of my tea while waiting for the sirens in the distance to get closer. And somehow I knew that tomorrow morning, my cup of black breakfast tea would taste a little sweeter. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah Marie, that was incredible. And apologies again for missing that, but you read that so beautifully and it was a great story. Off to you, Kat. Thank you, wow. I'm, every year, I am floored by the talent that is that exists in this province and so grateful that we're able to showcase a little bit of it. 
um, if you would like to take Winscript home with you, then there are a few places you can get that. You can go to the Saskatchewan Writers Guild website at skwriter.com uh, slash publications to um, purchase the magazine. Uh, sorry, for the online version of the magazine and also to purchase the magazine um, on our website. And you can also borrow the magazine from your library. Copies will be distributed to every high school and every library in the province. So ask your librarian if you can get that and they will do that. Um, I just want to give a thank you to, to everyone involved, to all of our contributors, to our audience today. Congratulations to the winners and honorable mentions. Thank you, Tara. Thank you to the unsung heroes of Winscript, the parents, guardians, librarians, teachers, and community members. Truly, if it was not for your efforts in supporting youth to submit to this magazine, we may not have a magazine. Thank you to our funders and sponsors, the City of Regina, SAS Culture, SAS Lotteries, Canada Council for the Arts, Print West. Uh, each contributor will receive two magazines for their submission and a PDF of the magazine is available on our website. It will be available as of tomorrow. Uh, it will all be updated now that we've had our Winscript launch. And um, yes, so I'd like to encourage people to submit to the magazine. Our next deadline is January 15th, 2021. And um, you can start submitting uh, around December, uh, or sorry, September, my apologies. Uh, so submissions will open at that time. And um, if you have any questions about the submission process, about being involved in the magazine, if you're a teacher and you'd like resources, any of those things that we can do to help support youth to submit to this magazine, please let us know. You can email me directly at swgevents at skwriter.com or go on our website and um, you can find some information there as well. There is a workshop happening today from four to six o'clock. Um, it's a partnership between the Saskatchewan Writers Guild and the Vertigo series. And there's still time to register. It's with Dr. Micheline Mailer, and it's called Language, Lines, and Leaping, the Art and Craft in Short Forms. So this is a webinar and uh, we're so excited to present this in partnership with the Vertigo series uh, with the Cathedral Village Arts Fest. So uh, you can, go on our Facebook, go on our website, uh, and you can check that out either the Cathedral Village Arts Fest Facebook page, the Saskatchewan Writers Guild Facebook page, or um, cvaf.ca or skwriter.com. There's lots of uh, things that I should have put up on the screen as I'm, I'm realizing now. Uh, and here is our, our title page. What I'd like to do now is stop the share and I'm going to change our view here to show everybody. So I'll invite all of our contributors, our feature poets um, to share your camera uh, and unmute your mic. And we'll collectively as a group here, we're going to try a digital bow. I've never done this, I don't know. Has anybody else done a digital bow? Just shake your, no, okay. So this is a first for all of us. So um, I guess on the count of three, we'll all kind of take a bow. So one, two, three. <laughs> awesome. Thank you very much. Um, your work is phenomenal and we are so very lucky that you are writing. Please keep writing. Please keep submitting and um, contributing to our great uh, literary community in Saskatchewan. Um, would anybody like to say a final word? Share a thought? No pressure but we have a platform. No, that's okay. That's totally fine. Go just, ahead. Um, thank you to everyone for coming. This is, this feels great. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Well, without further ado, I'm so proud of every single person here, of all of our contributors who we didn't hear from. And um, we will leave it at that. So thank you so much from our homes to yours. Take care.